Welcome to Advanced Renal Topics for Nurse Practitioners. I'm John Tsai from the Long Beach VA Medical Center and the University of California Irvine Medical School. Today, we will start off our course with a discussion on dysnatremias, or abnormal serum sodium concentrations. Specifically, we will be discussing how to differentiate between true hyponatremia and pseudo-hyponatremia, which is the important first step to assessing any patient with hyponatremia. As a reminder, the basic steps of assessing the hyponatremia patient are 1. Ruling out pseudohyponatremia by checking the osmolality. Remember that true hyponatremia is a low osmolar state, meaning that the serum osmolality will be low, typically less than 280. In the case of normal or high osmolality, both of these represent substances that may interfere with the measurement of the serum sodium concentration. These are what we term pseudohyponatremias since correction of the hyponatremia will be directed at correcting the underlying cause of the hyponatremia. We will continue to discuss further steps in the next videos, but as a refresher, you will want to think about the patient's volume status and their inherent ADH state next. And once you determine what their volume status is, you can then find out what therapy best fits the patient. In the case where you have pseudohyponatremia with a normal serum osmolality, again, this is osmolality levels between 280 to 300, there is usually an increase in either a protein or lipid that interferes with the measurement of serum sodium. We can demonstrate how this works on this diagram. First, the laboratory typically spins down the blood sample to separate it into two different phases, a solid state and a water phase. The water phase is then diluted by a fixed volume and the detector then assesses the concentration of the diluted sample. If there is an increase in protein or lipid in the serum, this results in a higher proportion of the solid phase to the water phase as seen on the right. The laboratory again dilutes this into a fixed volume, and since there is less sodium molecules, dilution into the fixed volume will result in a lower concentration of sodium as demonstrated here. If this isn't clear, please feel free to pause the video and count the number of individual sodium molecules to convince yourself why a lower sodium concentration will result on the right side, but not the left side after the fixed dilution. Is there a way to get around this? Well, yes, if we are able to directly measure the serum sodium concentration of the undiluted sample, then we can get at the true concentration of sodium. If you suspect that the patient has a high lipid or protein level in their serum, you can run the blood sample through an iStat or ABG machine, which directly measures the concentration of the sodium without having to dilute the sample. iStat or ABG machines are not as accurate and are more expensive compared to the larger laboratory equipment that is usually used which is why we don't use them all the time. Now, what about high osmolality hyponatremia, where the serum osmolality rises above 300? This is usually when you have something called an effective osmol that drives a water shift into the serum component. In this case, sugars such as glucose and mannitol are the typical offenders that result in hyperosmolar hyponatremia. The glucose, or sugar, increases the osmolality on the left side of this figure, and results in creating an osmolar gradient that drives the water from the extravascular to the intravascular space. When we then go to measure the sodium concentration, we will find that we have increased the water component and hence resulted in a lower serum sodium concentration, resulting in the hyponatremia. As a reminder, low osmolality, which is associated with values less than 280, is considered true hyponatremia. Normal osmolality is due to ineffective osmols and is associated with osmolality values between 280 and 300. This is what we traditionally think of as pseudohyponatremia. And lastly, high osmolality, which is associated with values above 300, is due to an effective osmol that is interfering with the measurement of your serum sodium. When we think about pseudohyponatremia and hyperosmolar hyponatremia, we generally want to think about a couple of different diagnoses. For pseudohyponatremia or ineffective osmols, you generally want to be thinking of high lipid or protein levels. This is most commonly associated with hypertriglyceridemia from pancreatitis or paraproteinemias from a diagnosis like multiple myeloma, which causes high level of immunoglobulins being secreted and increasing that solid phase. For effective osmols, the most common causes associated with high glucose levels associated with diabetic ketoacidosis or hyperosmolar hyperglycemic state, otherwise known as HHS. If you haven't noticed, you should try looking for the hyponatremia in these patients next time. 
In addition, mannitol from urological procedures can get absorbed into the serum and result in hyperosmolar hyponatremia, and high amounts of radio contrast for CT scans can do something similar. We can actually correct for hyponatremia due to glucose by using a formula. For each 100 of glucose above 100, the sodium generally decreases by about 2. For example, if you have a glucose of 400, we will see that there's a 300 difference between 100 and 400, and for each 100 increase in glucose, the serum sodium has to be corrected by 2. So in this case, we will have to correct the serum sodium by 6. If our detected serum sodium is 125 with our glucose of 400, then we will add 6 to our detected sodium of 125 to come up with a corrected glucose of 131. This is much less alarming compared to a glucose of 125. In all of these situations, you will want to correct the underlying cause resulting in the excessive osmols, higher lipid or higher protein levels, and your serum sodium will typically correct on its own afterwards. Let's do a question to see if you understand the material. Here's the question. A 52-year-old gentleman with a history of hyperlipidemia and diabetes is admitted for abdominal pain and was diagnosed with pancreatitis. Initial labs from the emergency room show a sodium of 126, potassium of 4.2, creatinine of 1.2, and a glucose level of 153. He was given two liters of normal saline in the emergency room, with the sodium increasing to 128. The serum osmolality before the two liters of normal saline was 295. What is your next step in management? Is it A, give additional one liter of normal saline bolus? Is it B, fluid restriction and NPO? Is it C, give a diuretic? Or is it D, check lipid levels? Go ahead and pause the video now if you need more time to answer the question. If you selected answer choice D to check lipid levels, congratulations, this is the correct answer. In this case, we can see that the serum osmolality is in the normal range, which means that this is likely a case of pseudohyponatremia. We should be looking for an ineffective osmol that is interfering with our serum sodium measurement, typically either an increase in protein or lipid levels. In this case, the presentation of pancreatitis is likely due to high triglyceride levels, which can increase the solid state and cause a pseudohyponatremia. The other differential diagnosis is, of course, DKA, but in this case, the glucose is normal and the osmolality is normal, neither of which fits the picture of DKA. Since our most likely diagnosis is hypertriglyceridemia in this case, we are going to want to immediately check lipid levels and treat the patient accordingly for pancreatitis. We typically don't have to do anything else for the hyponatremia, and the serum sodium will usually correct itself as the lipid levels fall. That's it for today, but do join us next time as we discuss volume status and ADH state.